fantastic to see you all. Um, I, I know that probably most of the people in this room weren't here last year, so uh, you're very, very welcome. And, and hopefully during the course of the day, we can try to address some of the questions that you have about SCAD. Um, don't hesitate to sort of pitch in and ask them at any opportunity. That's really what we're here for. Um, I will try and cover as many things as I can as I talk through it. And um, uh, if you get really, really uh, bored of listening to me rambling on, then there's a fantastic cricket pitch out there. It's a little bit damp today, but, uh, you know, go and have a game. So um, my remit then is to uh, talk in this session predominantly about uh, what SCAD is and a little bit about what we think about what causes it, its management, but uh, at, at the sort of, you know, the, the experience of a relatively newly diagnosed person. Um, so as Beck said, I'm uh, Dave Adlam. So my background is, is that I'm an interventional cardiologist uh, at the hospital here in Leicester. So my day job is um, putting stints into people with coronary artery disease and having heart attacks and putting valves into patients with uh, valvular heart disease. And um, so uh, how did I end up here chuntering into a microphone? Well, the answer to that question is uh, essentially down to, if you like, the generation before you of patients with SCAD who um, discovered that I wrote a review article about this condition in 1820 when I had sort of long black flowing uh, hair before this is what SCAD does to you if you're trying to do research. No. Um, and uh, came to see me in my clinic and uh, said, well, uh, this was Bex actually, came to see me and said, you know, I, I gave her the usual SCAD spiel, which many of you will have had along the lines of this is very rare. You'll probably never meet anybody else who's had this condition. I've probably only seen one or two before in my whole career. And she said, well, actually, um, I, I already know 15 other people with SCAD through, uh, through uh, Facebook. And she said, it's a disgrace that there's not quite, she's very much more polite than that, but that there's no research going on to, into this condition. And, and so things uh, began to get started. So um, I was forced to descend from my place of residence uh, here in the uh, ivory tower, which um, in, in, uh, in Leicester looks a little bit more concrete-like and a little bit less dreaming spires, but nonetheless, uh, that's where we, we began. So uh, I am an academic, so if I start to talk rubbish and you don't understand what I'm saying, just pitch in and ask questions as we go. So what is spontaneous coronary artery dissection? Well, uh, the first thing to say is that it is different from the conventional, uh, what we call atherosclerotic, the cholesterol, the lipid, the inflammatory condition that causes the vast majority of heart attacks. And many of you will have uh, experienced this when you were in hospital and you'll have sat on the coronary care unit and looked around you and thought to yourself, well, hang on a second, everybody sitting around me is, looks rather different to me. You know, they're uh, largely are older, often uh, much more predominantly male. And what am I doing here having a heart attack? Well, it's because it's a different problem. What happens in spontaneous coronary artery dissection is that you have a bruise that forms within the layers of the wall of the coronary artery. So if you think of the coronary artery as a tube that's taking blood to the heart muscle, that tube has a wall. And within that wall, there are lots of little layers. And what happens is, is you get this bruise that forms within it. And rather like if you've ever been kicked on the shins, my daughters do that to me from time to time, but if you have, you get a bruise on your shin, it feels tense as the pressure within it rises. And that's the same thing that's happening within the wall of the coronary artery. The bruise forms, the pressure within it rises, and it starts to compress the blood vessel from the outside. And uh, these are, this is a sort of schematic, but this is what it actually looks like from the inside. This is optical coherence tomography. I won't test you on that one later, but it's a laser light imaging uh, catheter to take pictures of the inside of a coronary artery. And what you can see, these little things here are the actual imaging catheter itself. But this is the coronary artery's true lumen labeled TL. That's where the blood should be flowing. And this uh, thing that looks like a crescent around the outside is the bruise. 
and it's wrapped right round the artery and it's compressing and squeezing it from the outside. And the effect of that, if you look at the angiogram on the left, the little white arrows, this black line should be smooth all the way down, but you can see how it suddenly gets thin around here and almost disappears at this point. And that's because outside that, there is this bruise squashing the artery down. And of course, if there isn't enough blood flowing down the artery, then the heart muscle starts to get into trouble. You get chest pain and ultimately you can uh, have a heart attack. So you can see that this is completely different from fatty deposits, cholesterol, all of those kind of things which you hear lots about when people talk about heart attacks. This is a different pathology, it's a different problem. I show this slide, it's, it's a difficult slide to show because it's a pathology specimen, unfortunately. It's from somebody who hasn't survived having a spontaneous dissection. But it does visually demonstrate what the problem is. So if you can see just here, that is the coronary artery that's been squashed completely flat. Can you see that? And outside the black here is the blood clot that's pressed against it and caused the compression and caused the problem. And it gives you a really clear idea because you can think to yourself that it's very difficult for blood to flow down the middle of that slit. And that's what causes the problem. So you've seen this picture already, um, but what I wanted to draw your attention to in some respects is what you can see around you in the room to some, to some extent, which is that the population of people with SCAD are different. They are, uh, generally speaking, quite a bit younger than patients who have conventional heart attacks. About nine out of 10 of them are female. And already by doing the research ourselves and uh, our partners in, in, in other centers who are accumulating data, we're starting to upend some things in the literature which have been present for years and years and years. Spontaneous coronary artery dissection does occur uh, in and around the time of pregnancy, usually uh, actually after pregnancy or very late in pregnancy. It can also occur in recognized conditions which we call connective tissue disorders, uh, things like Marfan syndrome, which some of you may have heard of. And if you read the if the old literature on SCAD, you'd think that everybody had those things. But actually what we've learned now is that yes, they do occur in that context, but that's actually uh, very unusual. And the vast majority of patients don't fall into that bracket. Most people are the people that you can see around you, the people that you can see in this photograph. That doesn't mean that those smaller groups aren't important. Uh, I can't remember, somebody, Bex, I think, mentioned the men. I don't know if we have any men in the room. I can see we have some men, but any male SCAD survivors. But these groups are also important. And uh, one of the things that we'll talk a bit, bit, little bit more about the research later, but understanding those groups that are smaller within the SCAD population requires us to work uh, in partnership with uh, other people across the world so that we can gather more patients in those groups. And that's really important aspect of the research, but we'll talk a bit about that later. So what happens during a SCAD event? Well, some of the most important things are that the diagnosis is made, if you like. And uh, you've heard already about the work that's being done by Beat SCAD, and uh, also we tr we're trying our best as well to raise awareness of this condition, because it is very frequently underdiagnosed uh, and the diagnosis is frequently made late. And the reason is the same as we've already alluded to, is that you don't look like people that should have heart attacks. You're not, you know, uh, uh, people with uh, older people with high blood pressure who smoke, who have high cholesterols and diabetes, those, all of those conventional re risk factors. So when uh, doctors or ambulance drivers or, or you know, obstetricians are seeing somebody with chest pain who doesn't fit that bill, very frequently the penny takes a long time to drop that this is a heart attack. And some of you will have had that experience, hopefully fewer and fewer as we get out there and try and uh, inform uh, colleagues across the piece. It's not just medical colleagues, but paramedic colleagues, A&E colleagues, OBS and gynae and so on about SCAD. So how do doctors figure out who's got this condition? Well, many of you will have had this experience. The heart tracing, the ECG may be abnormal, but it is not always abnormal. 
Uh, sometimes you will have a heart scan, an echo scan, and people will, say, will look and see that the heart's motion isn't quite right. But often it's the troponin, the blood test, where things happen. And again, it's a frequent uh, tale that we hear from our SCAD survivors that they came in, everybody said, ah, oh, you'll be fine. You'll, they were almost out of the door when somebody rang them up to say that the troponin was elevated and could you please come back again and all of this kind of thing. Um, there may be some other tests that uh, you, will, uh, un you will have undergone while people think about alternative explanations. And then uh, I think pretty much everybody will then have had a coronary angiogram. So the coronary angiogram tells us a reasonable amount about the SCAD. And again, we are learning quite a lot about this. And it's very important from doctor's perspective in terms of trying to understand the condition and recognize the condition. And you've already seen some pictures of this, um, so I won't dwell too long on the angiogram, but just again, to, uh, the, in this particular case, if it will play, uh, what you essentially see is that this artery that's supposed to be coming down here is very sluggish and then almost peters out altogether. And this, again, is different from what you see in conventional atherosclerotic coronary artery disease, where the problems tend to be much more up towards the beginning of the arteries. So again, there is, uh, it is perfectly possible to recognize this condition. It's just you know, to try to educate people to look out for it and understand it. And again, you can see in this example, this is right down here. But again, it's very unusual to have a completely normal artery and then a problem more than two thirds of the way down the artery. And that's one of the things that we try to talk to people about. So the SCAD, as I've said, it causes a heart attack because the blood flowing down the artery can't get past this external compression caused by the bruise. And unfortunately, when that happens, part of the heart muscle dies. And that's what a heart attack is. And essentially, after that, you will have a little scar on the heart where that injury has occurred. And obviously, it's very important to quantify that injury because that helps us to decide what treatment is best for you. So what do doctors do when they have somebody who's having a spontaneous coronary artery dissection? And again, this is something that we are moving uh, forward in in our advice. So the first approach uh, is a conservative approach. And this... Uh, you're not going to get tested on angiography at the end of this, so don't worry. Um, but all I'm trying to illustrate here is that this is, this is actually the same artery that I just showed you a few minutes ago, where you could hardly see it. But this is somebody who's then come back and had a follow-up angiogram. And this vessel that's actually stilled out down here is the same vessel after it's healed. And what we uh, understand is that the overwhelming majority, maybe all, but certainly the overwhelming majority of these uh, dissections will heal of their own accord if they are allowed to do so. So if it is possible, then uh, it, it is perfectly reasonable to manage these, uh, these conditions conservatively and allow the vessel to heal. But it is not always possible. So if there is not enough blood going down that artery, then as uh, the interventional cardiologist, sometimes you have to take action to try to save the heart muscle. And again, many of you out there will have had revascularization procedures for that reason. <coughs> this is a stenting procedure, so you can again, you're getting your eye in now, you'll be able to take over uh, my next on call, I think. Uh, so a little narrowing here, and, and this is after a stent has been put in to, uh, <coughs> to, to help to get the blood supply back up again. And that looks great, but there are different challenges with stenting in SCAD compared to what we normally see. So if you like my, my bread and butter. And that is that blood behaves rather differently, unfortunately, to all of those bits of cholesterol and fat and cells and things that we see when we're normally stenting coronary arteries. And uh, when you put a stent in, often what happens is you simply displace the blood clot on each side. And so people that have stenting for their dissection often require quite long segments of stenting. And that may be your experience. It doesn't mean that it's wrong that that's the treatment that you've had. 
Uh, it's just that sometimes you have to have that treatment. So if, you know, if you're in a pickle and there's no blood flowing down the artery, then your interventional cardiologist will have to do what they need to do to save the heart's muscle. But it is a particular challenge. And you know, for this reason, what we're trying to do is to encourage uh, clinicians where possible to be as conservative as is possible. Some patients will end up with bypass surgery as an emergency. There will probably be some of you in the room. There certainly, uh, certainly will be some in the group as a whole who have had a bypass operation. Um, and again, there are some problems here. The bypass operation gets you out of an immediate crisis. And sometimes you're in that situation and you have to uh, put someone through for a bypass operation as an emergency to, to, to get them out of a, 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 a situation. But because the artery then subsequently heals, often the bypass grafts will clog up over time because essentially they're competing with your normal coronary flow. And the bypass grafts, uh, the flow stops down the bypass graft when the flow is recovered in the normal vessel from healing. So bypass surgery, bypass grafts often help uh, to get you out of a crisis, but they are not a sort of panacea that they're going to sit there and act as a backup for the rest of your days, unfortunately. But again, that doesn't mean that it's wrong if you've had a bypass operation. Often it will be because your doctors have had a look at your angiogram and they've felt that action has to be taken to save the heart uh, and that there is... I have to stop doing this, don't I? I feel a bit like Donald Trump when I sort of... <laughs> put, put the hands in the pockets, otherwise you might all go and riot or something. No. Um, but the point I was trying to make was that uh, if you're in a situation where you've got a very proximal dissection right at the beginning of the artery, then sometimes it is the safest thing to do. But I'm just trying to get across to you both why particular things may have happened to you, but also the importance of some of the things that we're learning from looking at the angiograms from all of you that you and your doctors have kindly provided for us. Because what you have to remember also is that uh, a clinician like me working day by day in the NHS will probably only see probably less than one a year, one every few years, uh, a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. So again, it's natural and it's understandable that they won't necessarily know everything about these different variations in how to manage uh, SCAD. I might have to accelerate, otherwise I'm going to be um, run out of time. So after the SCAD event, there are a number of tests, and we'll talk a bit about more about some of these later on. But these are the tests that we like to try to, to see, and we're trying to progress with the NHS to persuade them to allow us to uh, fund this in and support reporting in all patients, but uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later. So we want to see what the heart function is. We want to assess that scar, and the best way to do that is probably with an MRI scan. In those patients who have not had stents, then we like to look at the coronary arteries to see that they have healed up. Uh, and finally, we like to look at the arteries elsewhere in the body to see if there are any other problems in the arteries uh, that we need to know about. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later and also later in the day. So, you've had SCAD. Uh, one or other of those processes of conservative management, stenting or bypass surgery uh, has happened. What now? Which medication uh, should I be taking after SCAD? Well, uh, the answer is, is that it will be a bit variable from person to person, but also it won't surprise you that we feel that, if you like, the conventional set of drugs that people get started on after a heart attack are not necessarily the uh, set of uh, medications which are the best treatments for people after SCAD. So I'll run through a few of the commoner tablets that are used. The antiplatelet treatments, that's your aspirin, your clopidogrel, ticagrelor, or prasugol, there are different ones. Often patients who have a heart attack will start on two, aspirin plus one of the others, and then stop taking one and, and continue to take maybe just aspirin after that. The problem that we have with this is that these drugs essentially thin the blood a bit. That's what they're there to do. 
And it's a little bit paradoxical to be giving a treatment that thins a blood, uh, the blood a bit for a problem which is primarily caused by a bleed in the vessel wall. You can see that there's a, a, a little bit of a difficulty with logic there. So we are relatively conservative about using these treatments. The, the, the uh, exception is if you've had a stent. So if you have had a stent, then you definitely need one of these treatments. And you'll probably need two of them for a period of time, maybe up to a year and then down to one. The reason for that is that stents themselves are usually a bit stickier on the inside. And that stickiness can last for quite a long time. So they are prone to clotting, the stent itself. And therefore, you need to take a blood thinner for that purpose. But if you are conservatively managed, we are moving in the direction of thinking about stopping these tablets after we've demonstrated a healing of the uh, dissection. Now, as with all of these things, these are clinical opinions based on our experience of looking after patients. And as with a lot of these things, you also find a bit of variation. So, for example, if you look at the uh, Canadian group, of Jackie Saw, at the moment they are still favouring continuing aspirin for life. So there is a bit of variation in that. Um, but that is our view and our practice. What about the beta blockers, those uh, um, end in olol tablets, bisoprolol, atenolol, propranolol? So these are tablets which are very good if you have a significant injury on your heart. Okay, so if you've got impairment of the pumping function as a result of the heart attack that you've had, then beta blockers, generally speaking, are indicated. So they should be considered. The same goes for the ACE inhibitors and their friends, the angiotensin receptor antagonists. So don't worry, you won't be tested on this at the end. But it's just many of you will, will have a list of these tablets and will be interested to know why you're taking them. So again, the beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors, and the angiotensin receptor antagonists are all great drugs if you've got impairment of left ventricular function. Where things are less clear is if the injury to your heart is very small. So if you've got very good pumping function of your heart, it's less clear as to whether these are helpful. And it's particularly the case because, again, many of you are very young, often very fit people, whose starting blood pressures are often relatively low. And if you then give treatments which lower the blood pressure more, from time to time you get people who come to see us in the clinic who sort of stagger in and say, well, I've got to sit down because otherwise I'm going to faint. And then you know, we're thinking to ourselves, well, you know, maybe the blood pressure tablets are a little bit overdoing things here. The other thing, and again, this is, there's sometimes differences here. We find quite a lot of our patients it continue to experience chest pains from time to time. You can see one or two nods out there. Um, and some people will get chest pains that are cyclical, that happen with the, uh, in, in, at a particular point in the menstrual cycle, often just before menstruation. And uh, we feel that some of those chest pains are due to a propensity of the artery to go into a sort of spasm. Arteries have a little muscle in the wall and they can squeeze of their own. Sometimes when they squeeze down, that can affect the blood supply to the heart and again can cause discomfort. And this is one of the reasons that we think people continue to experience chest pain after SCAD. And we uh, have found in our population quite a bit of success in treating some of those people who have chest pains as if they have coronary artery spasm, which is another condition. And when you treat coronary artery spasm, you tend to stop the beta blockers and use vasodilatory treatments, things that make the arteries relax. So again, there are some differences, but those are the sorts of drugs and those are the reasons why. Statins. Before I move on to statins, just a little another word on blood pressure tablets. Um, you may have high blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure, then you need blood pressure tablets. And the same applies for the cholesterol side of things. Personally, again, this is not a condition that's caused by a high cholesterol. This is not cholesterol that's deposited in your vessel wall in the same way as in a conventional atherosclerotic, as I keep calling it, heart attack. It's not that problem. So 
if you've got a normal cholesterol and you've had SCAD, I don't see that there's any logical reason to be lowering your cholesterol with drugs. However, if you have other reasons to be taking a cholesterol-lowering tablet, such as you've got a sky-high cholesterol, a strong family history, you know, a set of risk factors that means you may be at risk of that more conventional disease process, there may be reasons why you're taking it, okay? So, you know, it's a little bit balanced. It does depend from person to person. But I think that these treatments do need to be tailored in SCAD survivors in a slightly different way to um, patients who have conventional coronary artery disease. There may be some of you who are on the um, spironolactone or a plerinone. Again, those are treatments that tend to be reserved for people that have larger injuries on their heart. They support the heart in that case. And I've mentioned the vasodilators, which we have found to be useful quite uh, clinically and interestingly, um, so have our European colleagues. There's a bit of a European-US divide on vasodilators at the moment. Um, uh, right. There are specific issues in SCAD survivors, which again often don't apply to conventional uh, patients with more traditional uh, coronary artery disease. Those antiplatelet therapies can cause problems with menorrhagia, with bleeding at the time of menstruation. We find this to be, uh, again, a, a common problem and is, again, one of our drivers for modulating uh, antiplatelet therapy. And sometimes we also have to think about uh, 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 other strategies for controlling menorrhagia. And um, one of the ways in which we've, we've had some success in doing that is with the Mirena coil, which is a sort of local hormone releasing coil, which can be quite successful in, you know, in some patients who have this problem. Contraception is a difficult one. Why is it difficult? Well, we know that SCAD has a female sex prevalence. We also know that it occurs uh, around and after pregnancy. And it also seems to peak around and in a few years after the menopause. So all of those things are telling us that female sex hormones have a role. But what it's not telling us is, is how, and this is something that we're very interested in from the research perspective, but we don't at the moment understand that connection. And because the connection is obvious, things like contraception, uh, HRT, um, cause concern because our worry is, well, if this is something that's associated with female sex hormones, if we're giving them in a medication or we're giving them in HRT, is that going to increase the risk of problems? I don't think we have the evidence at the moment to support that. So it's a concern, but it's not, not something that's known. But practice amongst those of us who look after these patients, again, is to try to minimise that. So to use barrier contraceptive methods where possible, to think about uh, low-release hormone uh, approaches. I mentioned the Mirena coil, or the, um, there are some uh, implants which have a very low dose of progesterone, which can be helpful. So it's a difficult one, as you're, as you're going to find out through the course of the day. Um, we don't have all of the answers, but clearly we have to... Uh, look after the patients who come to us in the best way that we think is possible. So a lot of these things are based on our experience and opinion. The current chest pains I've already talked a little bit about, um, and I think uh, later in the day perhaps there'll be some discussion about the emotional consequences of spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And we are, cardiologists are universally rubbish at dealing with the emotional aspects of heart disease. We're pretty useless at dealing with our own emotional aspects. Um, uh, and yet this is enormously important because, of course, uh, you know, the situation is that you're uh, leading a normal life. You may have young children. You may have, you know, an intense job, uh, families, all of those things that we all do. And then out of the blue, with no risk factors, no expectation, you have uh, a heart attack. And it is not surprising that that is going to have consequences and in some people, those consequences are, are greater than others. And uh, that is not a defeat. That is not, uh, you know, a, 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 an issue. It's reality. And uh, what we have to try to work towards and think about are the ways through that process. And, you know, there are all sorts of different things that we can think about 
Um, I'm a big fan of the sort of exercise rehabilitation route, but there are many others. And in fact, this day is one of those things, being able to meet with others, to share experience and to understand a bit about what it means to have SCAD is hugely important and hugely helpful, I know, to many of you. Uh, a couple of things at the bottom. Oh yes, I, I jumped to exercise early because people often ask about this. So again, the argument goes, we think that this tear has happened in an artery and I'll debunk tears a bit later in the day. Uh, and we know if you go through the literature for spontaneous coronary artery dissection that there are some associations. So there are some people who are busting a gut doing weights who will have a tear of a dissection occur in the coronary artery. And so people take, uh, take that and leap forward to say, well, you know, exercise is bad. And I don't think that that's true. And in fact, that is now uh, debunked by two very nice papers in the last year, both of which show exercise rehabilitation in spontaneous coronary artery dissection survivors is safe and is, uh, uh, is, is beneficial in terms of th those aspects of getting back uh, to life, to recovering, to getting over the mental aspects of what happens with spontaneous coronary artery dissection. So my view is probably, you know, uh, going into the sort of nuclear, uh, the, the uh, Olympic weightlifting tournament is not a great idea. And um, the beat scan walk, excellent concept. Cardiac rehabilitation, great concept. And we uh, work quite a lot with rehab teams. They ask us, we often get questions, I get emails saying, oh, we've got a SCAD survivor, I'm a bit worried about you know, whether we can rehabilitate them. The answer is yes, yes you can. It's written up, it's perfectly safe, and it's, it, you know, it's more than that. We know that this is a beneficial approach. Defibrillators, this is a very, I, I mentioned this sort of um, European, US um, differences and actually, um, we're, we're great friends with our US partners and, and they are key collaborators in moving forward in understanding research into SCAD. So I don't want to stress differences too much. But I can remember having a telephone conference with some Americans interested in SCAD. And one of them said to me, well, we put defibrillators in all of our SCAD survivors. I was like, why would you do that? He said, well, we're worried about recurrence, so we think we should put a defibrillator into everybody. And, you know, I think that there is no evidence behind that. And the strategy for defibrillators should be the same as for conventional heart attacks, that they are preserved for those patients who've had a big injury. So, again, there will be some people out there who uh, have had a, a, you know, a bigger heart attack as a consequence of their SCAD, and we'll have a defibrillator. That is perfectly appropriate. But I don't think that we need to be uh, putting defibrillators into, uh, into anybody and everybody. It's a selected group. Another question. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to anticipate questions because I'm concerned about the threat of the overflowing red bucket later. But, but please do put your questions down and put them in there because you know, we'll, we'll do our best. And I would be disappointed if you left today with a burning question that we haven't tried to answer. Should my family be tested? What do we know about the genetics of spontaneous coronary artery dissection? Well, the first thing is that the majority of patients, the overwhelming majority of patients, appear to be sporadic. So they do not appear to be strong family associations in spontaneous coronary artery dissection. There are a small number of families, okay? So in our series, and we're somewhere in the 400s now, we have... Uh, two sisters who've had this condition. So that's one family. So that gives you an inclination as to, you know, how strong the genetic association is. Yes, genes will have a role and they will hopefully give us a bit of information to help us to understand the pathophysiology, the underlying causes, to give us some hints about the roots. But this is not something where if you've had a SCAD that you're daughters, your sisters, and so on, your, uh, you know, your sons even, uh, or, and so on, are, are particularly at risk. It's of research interest, but we do not need to be genetically testing people. Indeed, we do not necessarily need to be genetically testing you. Some of you will have had genetic tests, 
uh, in some centres that seems to be fairly routine. But what uh, uh, has been demonstrated by routine genetic testing for connective tissue type disorders, your, you know, some of you will have read about Marfan syndrome, Erlos Danlos syndrome, those type of words um, that float around on the internet. But if you routinely test SCADs, you don't find very many. Uh, you find very, very few. So again, I think it's much more a question of you know, the obvious, if we've got somebody who's got a typical Marfan phenotype in front of us, then we'll look at it. But it doesn't, you don't need to be generally genetically tested for these things. But we are still interested in your genes. Pregnancy is a difficult question, and it is one that we get asked, of course, because our patients are, some of our patients are young women. Some have uh, been lucky enough to have a family before their event, but some have not. What do we know about pregnancy? Well, the first thing is that, again, I mentioned this earlier, um, uh, that how crucial it is for those of us who are interested in this condition to work together so that we can understand SCAD in men. I mentioned before, pregnancy. And, and this is another area. We have to work together because the number of uh, SCAD survivors who have had pregnancy is very small. We um, have been looking at this with our American colleagues, and we think we have identified 21 pregnancies in SCAD survivors, of which one has gone on to have a SCAD. And the person who had the SCAD did not have their first SCAD in pregnancy. So what does that say? What it says is that we can't say that pregnancy after SCAD is risk-free, I'm afraid, because there is a documented uh, um, recurrence in somebody uh, who has had a pregnancy after their first SCAD. But we do also have SCAD survivors who have um, gone through pregnancy and, and obviously we've uh, you know, kept in close contact with them uh, as they've gone through that process. So ultimately it's a difficult personal decision and we are very happy to um, uh, help with discussing and thinking about those things if and when it ever becomes relevant to, to anybody in the audience. Recurrence. It's the sort of um, elephant in the room in some respects. I think there'll be a lot of you out there who will feel that you know having a heart attack at your age and with no risk factors and completely unexpected out of the blue is a tough thing, but you can pull through it and you can get out the other side and rebuild as long as Dr. Adlam can reassure you that it will never happen again. And I wish I could, but I can't. But what I can say is that with quite a lot of these things, um, we are still firming up on what that risk is. And my suspicion is that the risk is probably not as high as you will read on the internet and from some of the other series that have been published. Why do I think that? First of all, because we've had sight of our own data. So we're starting to do all of the number crunching of our own data. So why would our data be different from anybody else's? Well, it's about how that data is gathered. And um, we're changing the way that our data is gathered over, over the course of time. The first studies, so many of you will have heard of the Mayo Clinic series, for example. The first studies were done by collecting patients who had self-referred to an American center of excellence, the Mayo Clinic. So they flew from California, from Texas, from all of those other states that uh, have just been busily voting in Donald Trump, um, to the Mayo Clinic uh, to be assessed for their SCAD. But what you have to remember is that if you make that effort to go all the way to the Mayo Clinic, you will tend to be somebody who's had a more extreme problem. So you might have had a recurrence, you might have had a bigger event. Those are c the kind of things that might motivate you to get on a plane. Whereas if you've had a less severe event, which you've kind of ridden through without um, many problems and you've been managed conservatively medically, you're less likely to fly to the Mayo Clinic to be seen. So what this means is, is that those early series tend to be enriched for patients who have had 
a worse experience. And that's why we think that some of those series, and particularly the data on rec rec recurrence, may give a picture which is, you know, which is worse than reality. Okay? So that's you know, something to say on the subject, but I think it is important to understand that this can happen again sometimes. But it's the same with other medical conditions, of course. If you have a heart attack conventionally, it can happen again. If you have another health problem, like a cancer or something like that, it can come back. But the probability is not high. You're much more likely not to have a recurrence than you are to have a recurrence. And I think it is a, one of those things where you have to try and get your head into a place where, yes, if something happens, you'll react to it. But you have to not wait for something to happen that may never happen to you. So I think probably recurrence is less common than we think. Yes, we have to be sensible if something happens to us. But I, I think, no, you don't have to, you know, get up every morning thinking, I wonder if I'm going to get through to the evening. It's lucky it's my last slide then. Uh, God, that was brilliant timing, wasn't it? Um, so I'm going to talk about the research later, but this is um, the Laetoli footprints, which uh, are, were laid down by an Australopithecus in somewhere in Kenya uh, 50,000 years ago as they walked through some volcanic ash which had recently uh, fallen in the area. And the reason for showing it is because I think it is illustrative of what SCAD and SCAD research is about. It's about collaboration. It's about partnership. It's about collaboration between doctors and patients, researchers and uh, SCAD survivors, researchers and researchers, uh, and also hopefully between SCAD survivors uh, uh, themselves. And uh, in my mind, at least, when I saw this picture. These, uh, I don't know whether it's a, a mother and a child or two Australopithecines, um, but in my mind they're holding hands and I think that that's what SCAD and SCAD research should be all about. Mm -hmm.